to actually be one chain, one office working eight hours per day to cover the 24 hours. And there too, already like 20 years ago, you had this issue. Like how do we account for that? And, and profit splits have been a useful answer in that space and that's something we are exploring in the space of uh, uh, global value chains for the future. The second one, so why don't you go for uh, harmonization of tax uh, rates? I think because first, politically, there is no willingness to do that. I think the political mandate is to strengthen the framework for coordination so that countries can retain their own sovereignty on tax matters. And countries want to have their say on their tax policy. Second, I don't think you get there by only harmonizing the rate. You would have to harmonize also the base. Because then I, we can all say, okay, we go for 10%, but then we have to say 10% of what? And that's not something that I think the world is ready for. Best evidence of that is in the European Union, which is an integrated market with common rules. Uh, that, like th they have been trying for more than 20 years to do what they call the common consolidated corporate tax base without even the rate, just for the base. And there is no willingness to do so. So our approach is, not about harmonization, but it's about coordination and about creating a framework within which then countries can make their free uh, choices. One last question. Yeah, uh, may I? Yeah, I'm please. I have two quick questions, both to Mr. Russo. It's very good that you're so hopeful of the BEPS project, but do you not see a contradiction between countries being party to the BEPS on paper, and then yet, as in the Indian case, where a particular large multinational was at, you know, the taxes were being levied, the government of the country where it was domiciled did put pressure on the Indian government to, as it were, come to an out-of-court settlement or some kind of a compromise. That is one. Though officially that country was also part of perhaps the BEPS project. That's first question. Second question is that since so much is attached to the importance of what is a permanent establishment, is it not very difficult in a world where it is possible for companies to virtually not have a permanent establishment anywhere in the world? In which case, again, in the, as, as in the case of Matt, where the entire issue was that did they have a permanent establishment at all? If you look at permanent establishment as a, from where you're getting bulk of your profits or you know, income as constituting a permanent establishment, regardless of whether you had a registered office or not, then the entire concept of a permanent establishment becomes very important. And today it's possible for companies to virtually not have a permanent establishment anywhere in the world. I, I'm sorry, I'm not sure I understood the first question. So I'll, I'll start answering the second and then, and then, and then we try to, to clarify. Uh, yes, that's an issue. What we have found out is that it is an issue that is very often overestimated and that is an issue that very often is underestimated. I, I give you an example. There is a lot of concern around the world in a number of countries with one specific company okay, that provides a search engine that allows you to find whatever you want on the web, okay? Now, I was reading the newspaper and one of the candidates to the IT award of the year is the CEO of the Indian subsidiary of this company, of this group, okay? Which shows that the debate sometimes is, is, is misdirected. So in many instances, when you want to do business in a country at large scale, you do need a presence there. And these companies, very often, they have a presence there in the form of subsidiaries. Maybe in the world of the next 10, 15, 20 years, it will be different. It's not the case tomorrow. The, the first question, I'm not sure I, I understood who was putting pressure on whom. Uh, no, as I said, countries also, do they say they are very much against the entire idea of you know, you're shifting your base erosion, etc., and no country would like to see its base to be eroded when a corporate which is domiciled in a particular country is at the receiving end, in the sense some tax is being levied, then the government of the country where it is domiciled does put pressure on the Indian government. It has happened in the case of a major telecom company, which I think everybody is uh, aware of, where the country to where that company was domiciled did put pressure on the Indian government to back off and not levy tax. Yeah, and, and I think that's a different type of setting. So it's a type of setting where the two governments concerned don't necessarily agree on the way in which the rules should be applied. And that's where you have a dispute. And, and what we have tried to do is to improve the mechanisms to make sure that this dispute is resolved. 
That's, that's all I can say. Uh, I actually, uh, actually, we have run out of time and we are uh, there is another session to start just now. So I'd like to thank the panelists and I'll request the audience to also give them.